you Anurag for uh, inviting me over, for choosing a subject which is uh, at the heart of every journalist here, reclaiming space for or rebuilding trust in journalism, I think, because I think there can be no more apt a word. Uh, the fact that we have to have this as a as a as, as the title of the conference itself uh, explains where uh, journalism, uh, the dangers of journalism, uh, and some of them uh, Anurag touched upon. Uh, you know, we are peddling with uh, how journalism is divided, journalism that is fighting a very strong battle of nationalism, fundamentalism, religious divide, where we don't know uh, behind a certain media organization what is the ideology that is informing their their journalism uh, and whether the ideology one is it is one thing you know I always say that it's all right for a media organization to have a bias in fact it's important that a media media organization has some bias it will naturally have some bias you are a product of a certain political social thinking and the reason why you are in this line is because you have a certain voice you have a certain belief system as to what political system your country should follow, what societal setup your country should follow. And you want to use your journalism uh, as a means to express that voice. We all know that journalism is not a career that you, you join to make money. I mean, I don't know whether that was ever the case, but definitely not today. Uh, so it is a place uh, for the passionate one. It is a place where you come with a certain commitment to social causes. And so therefore you will have a bias. But does that bias reflect in the pages of your publication in a forced manner or whether you foreground objective journalism and let the underlying socio-political thought be a foundation for that? That is what differentiates a more ethical publication from a not so ethical. The one that force fits facts to fit a certain narrative is engaging in a certain propaganda. The one which is doing journalism reporting with a certain starting uh, foundational you know, view, but then lets the reporting take over, lets the fact take over, and then lets ensures that what they are publishing out there or what they're speaking out there in television is informed by the facts, is you know, is the one is the model that we need to sort of move towards. Uh, and that's a question that media per se has to answer because clearly I think the fact that there is a lot of deficit of trust amongst uh, the people uh, is a reflective of, of a problems that we have created for ourselves. Uh, and the answer has to come from within. The answer cannot be forced upon us. And the reason I'm talking about answer being forced upon us is because uh, the government, uh, irrespective of political lines, let's be very honest, you know, it's very convenient to say that whatever problems we are seeing in journalism is a product of last 10 years. No, that's not the case. Any government will try and control media. That's been the case. Any government will use, uh, you know, whatever defensible justification they might have to put in place some laws to say, no, we want to weed out fake news. We want to weed out misleading news. We want to weed out content which is dubious. And therefore, we are creating a legal system which, will, which is meant to control. That is the justification. That is the ostensive justification. And because media is not doing its own affairs properly, because there is a lot of uh, distasteful content in the online space, uh, and because uh, there are so many vested interests, and that's why we need, we will create a legal system which will curtail that voices. That's the justification. But obviously we know that the, the reason why these laws have been put together is to actually control the media, not to control unwanted uh, elements uh, uh, so much as uh, elements that are critical of the government. And because media is not doing its job properly, and because we, are, we have lost our credibility, it gives a handle to the government to say, okay, come, we will be the monitor. We will be the class monitor. Uh, and we will create a legal system which will, which will, where we will decide what is right and what is wrong. Uh, yes, we are here today. Yeah, just yesterday, I'm sure many of you have uh, followed the news, the broadcast bill that was introduced. A new version of the broadcast bill was introduced a few weeks ago in a very covert, secretive manner, given to a few sets of organization, in a very watermarked copy was given, top secret was written on top of that, and no public consultation was being done. And the broadcast bill, enough reportage has been done in the last few weeks, 
uh, it was it it had created a system of monitoring your content under very vague subjective laws those subjective laws are open to interpretation depending on where you are in the political spectrum where you are in uh, you know what you want to prove right or wrong and the final authority in all of this there was a three tier structure that they have sort of put in place two tiers being self regulation and the third tier being a government controlled uh, you know board broadcast broadcast advisory council headed by a government servant government uh, secretary so the ultimate power to decide what is right or wrong on very subjective questions was being given to a government officer and we all know who will the government officer answer to what are their interests not only that and that was a that was the provision of the broadcast bill that was introduced in november last year as well now they've come up with a new bill not only that they also in, extended the broadcast bill to include independent content creators the youtubers the uh, you people running twitter channels and their the the new broadcast bill was supposed to control them as well and put in place the same cumbersome system of content monitoring and the right word is content censorship extended to even the independent content creators because what has happened in the last few years is as mainstream media has been extremely reticent in questioning the government the independent voices have taken control and in this election we saw how the independent voices were the ones who were at the forefront of asking important questions now the government wanted to extend the broadcast bill to even control censor and shut down those independent voices there was a lot of collective action by the way in the last two weeks you might have seen but all by independent organizations none of the big organizations took on the bill none of the big newspaper and industry associations some of which i'm part of took on the fight head on it was the independent organizations it was of course the guild did it i'm of course i'm done, i'm i'm associated with the guild but organizations like guild digipub many other independent uh, civil rights and journalists uh, took on the voice and the government of course has now at least officially said that they will reconsider the bill now these are important things to sort of take derive a lot of hope from because the simple lesson is if you fight and if you fight collectively no matter how strong a government there is they will listen to you this is important because broadcast bill was the most recent step in a very elaborate legal system that has been put in place in the last 3 to 4 years to control space control freedom of expression not just freedom of press please understand there is nothing called freedom of press in the constitution you know we talk about constitution constitution liberty values there is nothing called freedom of press there is freedom of speech and the constitution framers were very clear that the press will have the same amount of freedom that any average individual will have which is a very noble thought why should you know why should there be more freedom of press and not enough freedom of expression at an individual level it's the same so there is freedom of speech and expression in the constitution article 191 article 192 unfortunately is restrictions on freedom of speech which allows government to say that which allow, it gives the government powers to con make laws to curtail freedom of speech on a certain number of grounds what are those grounds security of state friendly relations with your neighboring states public order morality decency contempt of court who will decide what is this this is a very subjective you know to something which might be obscene to you may not be obscene to me something in my view might be seen as regular factual reporting of a clash between two communities it's a objective reportage to somebody else it might say no by reporting that there was a clash going on you are further creating an environment of further clashes so therefore you are creating content which is wrong because if i am a government servant if i am a dm of a of a of a of a district where clashes are happening and if the press is reporting very freely that these clashes are happening today i can say that no by reporting on the clashes you are further infusing clashes whereas my duty as a journalist is to report on the clash people need to know the clash happened yes if i am obviously saying a clash happened when there was no clash that's a different thing but the reportage of clash cannot be uh, cannot be a ground for curtailing my freedom of speech unfortunately our constitution has left this great amount of subjectivity 
to decide what is right or wrong. And what has happened in the last 80 years, a lot of laws have been introduced where the governments across party lines have used these provisions and put them in various places that the government will have authority to do X, Y, Z if a certain content is falling foul of Article 19.2. This has happened in cable and satellite television laws. This has happened in, uh, in, in, uh, in the IT Act. This has happened in the new Press Act, which was passed last year. Uh, three years ago, they, the, the government introduced something called the IT Rules under the IT Act, in which they put in place this three-tier structure that I was talking about in the broadcast bill, where again, the same provisions that if a content is liable, if it creates enmity between two communities, if, it, if, if it's obscene, if it is against security of state, so on and so forth, the same eight or nine provisions that they are there, then uh, the government, then somebody, if somebody has a problem with such content, the co that content can be pulled down. So it's censorship, subjectivity. So IT rules were put in place in 2021. There's something called fact-checking unit that was introduced as an amendment uh, to these IT rules last year in 2023. The guild challenged that fact-checking unit because the fact-checking unit was very simply saying that if the government thinks that any content regarding its own affairs is fact, is fake, or even worse, misleading, then they have an authority to block that content. Now the government is saying that you, us, as journalists, if we ask them a question and if you report on a certain version of their policy which does not conform with them, then they can flag that as fake and they can order the internet service providers to block that content. So I am being a judge in my own case. I came out with a, uh, with a policy or with a, not even a policy, I came out with an announcement that last year they were just, you know, uh, the number of hate crimes in the country went down from 100 to 20. And a certain newspaper does an investigation and say, no, actually the hate crimes increased from 100 to 150. I can say that actually because you have uh, counter, uh, contradicted me, your content is wrong, your content needs to be pulled down. That was the essence of the fact-checking unit. We approached the court, this, we approached the Bombay High Court, Bombay High Court had a split, split verdict, we went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court has said, okay, fine, let the Bombay High Court decide, finally. But in the interim, the fact-checking unit cannot be instituted. So imagine the amount of control that the government was trying to put in place by a simple, uh, by a simple uh, you know, amendment to the IT rules. The Press Act was passed last year. There again, they have introduced the Press Act, actually, by the way, uh, replaced the erstwhile Press and Registration of Books Act, which was set up in 1867 by the British. Now, we all talk about the colonial laws. We all talk about how, you know, our laws are supposed to be more democratic than the colonial laws. Now, there was nothing in the PRB Act, the original PRB Act, that did not allow anybody from publishing a newspaper. You could be anybody in the country. You could be charged with any crime, sedition being the biggest crime in the British India. I mean, Gandhi was imprisoned under sedition. Lokmanya Tilak was in imprison under sedition. They both were convicted and imprisoned under sedition and they both were, by the way, publishers and editors. Gandhi of Young India, Tilak of Kesri. The PRB Act did not allow the power to the government of India, run by the British, to ask them to stop the newspaper. That is the amount of press freedom that PRB Act allowed. It was only meant to catalogue the newspapers in the country. It was not meant to control the newspapers. You could be convicted of any any crime and you still had the right to express your views. The new Press Act says that if you are convicted of a terrorism activity defined under UAPA, you cannot be a publisher. And UAPA has been used against journalists in the last five years. It has been used against some independent media organization. It, is, it was used against a guy called Siddiq Kapan, who was under jail for reporting on that uh, uh, rape incident. So, to say that we are replacing a colonial law with a more liberal law is of course factually not happening. It's not, it's not correct. On top of that, the government came up with a telecom bill, telecom act last year, where again content which is same article 19.2 can be blocked by telecom operators. The broadcast bill has the same provisions. 
criminal laws have been replaced by the country. We all know about Bharatiya Nyaya Sanita, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the law to replace the CRPC. Now, these were laws, the IPC, the original IPC was, play, was, uh, was put together in 1860. The new I, uh, criminal laws have far broader provisions to control free speech. Something called sedition was there in original IPC. The guild challenged sedition law because sedition has got no space now in this modern world. The country that introduced sedition to our legal system, the British, have removed sedition long ago. There is probably hardly any big democracy where sedition as a crime is there. IPC still had it. We challenged the court, we went to the court, we challenged the law, the Supreme Court called the government, the government said we are reconsidering the sedition law. So the Supreme Court said, very well, we are putting the sedition law under abeyance. This was in 2022, which means that no new fresh FIRs complaints to be lodged under sedition. We are very happy that okay, we have won a small battle. Now the new criminal laws have come back and they have reintroduced sedition without calling it sedition. They are calling it treason. And whatever was the scope, and it's a very technical uh, detail, I have the details here, but I won't bore you with the details. The scope of sedition, what, was, what could be called sedition, actually has been broadened in the new criminal laws. And how is sedition done? Sedition is done by words spoken or written, including in electronic format. So whatever we are writing, if it is not to the liking of the government, whether this government or any other government, can be called not sedition, can be called treason. And it carries the same penal, penal provisions. There's something called, and this is all in section 152 of the new uh, criminal code. There's something called uh, section 197, which is called promotion of national unity. And there again, uh, any word spoken or written, which goes against national unity and national integration is a criminal offense. Now you Think of the country, the, live, the, the, the kind of country we are living in, where there are clashes, ethnic clashes going on. In where Manipur, there's clashes going on. Kashmir, there are going on. Obviously, Anurag was talking about how religious conflict gets flared up by media. Now, reporting of any kind of a clash, again, what I was talking about earlier, can be perpetrated, can be argued that by reporting on clashes, you are creating a division. You are against national unity. So, on one end, there are laws like IT rules, the new broadcast bill as and when it comes and becomes an act. The Data Act, by the way, Data Act also was introduced last year, which also has implications for press. And the Press Act. These four acts in the civil domain have provisions that can allow a government officer to block your content. At the criminal end, they have given the same powers to police officer to file an FIR against you or to register a, fire, register a FIR against you on a complaint which says that your article or your whatever content is falling foul of treason, falling foul of national unity. It's very easy to argue that. I can argue that in a moment that what you have written is against any of these two things. Who will decide? Supreme, uh, the police officer? The police officer is answerable to whom? The home ministry of that state or the centre? You can go and challenge in the court. Finally, in most cases, you will find that the courts will come to the right side. Generally, I've seen that. But the process is two, three, four, five, eight years. You may be imprisoned in that. Even if you're not imprisoned, you have to fight it out. If you're an independent news uh, reporter, do you have the wherewithal to do it? Do you have the wherewithal to take on the legal expenses? Do you have the wherewithal to spend your time? So the system has become extremely elaborate, both in the civil space and the criminal space. And that's the important thing we have to sort of keep in mind, that how do we fight it out? The broadcast bill, by the way, is, is one such example, but I want to end it by giving another example. The British had uh, put in place an act called Vernacular Press Act in 1878, which was meant to control the Indian press at that time. By the way, 1870s is the time when the Indian press was finding a voice. You know, uh, obviously Lokmanya Tilak started a paper called Kesri. Lots of newspapers were started by, uh, by, 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 by nationals all over the country. Uh, these newspapers were, to be, were meant to be a voice, Indian voice of nationalism, of freedom struggle and so on and so forth. These papers, of course, started and of course from 1900 onward, 
the the freedom movement took on a far more mass color under gandhi and suddenly the papers were sort of you know were at the forefront of that you know taking that voice so 1910 the british put in place something called the indian press act where uh, the i'm just going to refer to my notes for one second the sorry one second yes the idea was to control the press and the means of publication to exercise control over publishers suppress seditious content and exercise control of content that was coming in from india to the uk and basically that it had a very elaborate procedure where powers were given to detain content which was which was objectionable the indian press owners had to furnish some security uh, to to be able to run their press and if your content was found you know seditious or objectionable your security could be sort of usurped uh, the de- district mag- magistrates had powers to you know arrest you see seditious literature so a lot of control a lot of elaborate control that we are talking about right now you know were there in the indian press act in the next 5 to 8 years about 1000 such cases were registered where publications were banned fines were levied and apparently according to some data i found within 7 to 8 years some 5 lakh rupees of security was was uh, was collected by the by the british government now i can imagine 5 lakh rupees in 1910 i don't know what inflation you can do but it will be definitely few hundred crores right now so imagine uh the amount of penalty that was what was put put uh, was was levied on indian press uh, was was sizable the indian press rose to the challenge there was a lot of objection there was a lot of fight against this law obviously the freedom struggle was there this entire debate reached the british parliament and finally the prime minister in 1919 and subsequently 1922 gave an order to the secretary of state of india to withdraw the law it took 10 to 11 years under a british government which was not a democratic government it was a colonial government to fight a law put in place by the britishers to control indian press indian press rose to the challenge fought it out it took 10 years but again again the, under the government which was meant to control the country they were able to reason it out and this law was repealed finally what is stopping us from fighting against these laws that are being put in place by a democratic government at a time when our voice can be heard far more easily thanks to social media thanks to multiple uh, outlets that are there what is stopping us it is only our will our collective action our ability to sort of organize ourselves together we need to keep in mind that the legal system legal challenges or may sound innocuous at the first glance well they're not innocuous in any way by the way uh, but the the uh, the, uh, the you know the gravity the gravitas of these of the of the of the danger they pose is existential for the press uh, and we have to sort of uh, collectively organize ourselves uh, irrespective of our ideology our party lines or if we have a party lines or whatever other parameters are there and we have to reclaim the space for press to survive in this country thank you